Well, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for my senior care and life planning seminar. My name is Assemblymember Mark Berman, and I represent 13 cities in Southern San Mateo County and Northern Santa Clara County in the California State Assembly. This is the fifth event I've held in my six years in the assembly geared towards protecting seniors uh, and, and, and some of them protecting seniors from scams. We have four phenomenal expert panelists, so I'm going to keep my comments short to give them more time to speak. My hope is that this seminar will help you navigate with confidence the many end-of-life options presented to you. Our goal is to provide guidance on the types and extent of care you may want, the big financial decisions ahead, and how to keep yourself and your loved ones safe from scammers. By the end, I hope you will have a better sense of what matters to you at the end of life and how to ensure your wishes are followed. And while these can be difficult conversations to have, they are worth it in the long run. 90% of people think it is important to talk about end of life wishes with their loved ones, but only 27% have done so, according to a 2021 study published in the Journal of Psychosocial Nursing and Mental Health Services. Studies also show that people who have planned ahead for this time in their lives have a greater quality of life when that time arrives. Surviving family members also experience less anxiety and stress during the process. I do want to recognize that we only have an hour and a half today, which is not nearly enough time to go into detail on all of the big issues being covered. If you'd like more information on any of these topics, please send a message through my website letting me know. I want to make sure I'm getting you the most helpful information and resources possible, but I can't do that without your feedback. We will also save time for Q&A after all of the presentations. Please feel free to add your questions and comments into the chat or Q&A feature at the bottom of the page. If you are watching on YouTube, you can submit questions through the YouTube comments, which my team will be monitoring. If we don't get to your question, we will do our best to get back to you with an answer in the coming days. I also want to add, if you have been scammed and you don't know what to do, call my district office in Palo Alto and we will help you and direct you to the resources that can help. The number is 650-324-0224. Again, that's 650-324-0224. Lastly, thank you so much to our expert panelists for taking the time to join us today. It's now my pleasure to introduce Mary Mottison from Mission Hospice and Home Care to get today's event started. Now, as I turn things over to Mary, I want to launch a quick poll to help frame some of her presentation. The poll, which unfortunately can uh, only be completed by those watching on Zoom, and it just popped up right in front of me, right in front of my script. Uh, the, the, the poll says, do you have an advanced care directive? You can answer yes, no, or I don't know. And it would just want to give folks just a little time to answer. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to answer. Do I have an advanced care? I, I do not. So if everybody wants to go, oh, hosts and panelists can't vote. So I don't even get to vote. But I hope everyone right now is taking some time to vote. Let's give another 10 seconds, real quick. Yes, no, not sure. Thank you for your patience, Mary. Absolutely. Not sure can be. I don't know what one is, too. Indeed. And which, but I bet in 15 minutes, they're all going to know what one is. Yes, yes. Uh, all right. Why don't we go ahead and share the results? Yes. Awesome. 73% said they do have an advanced care directive. 26% said no, they do not have an advanced care directive. And one said, I don't know. And that one person will be better informed by the end of uh, these presentations. Great. Well, Mary, why don't I turn it over to you? Thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much for hosting this and for the opportunity. And thank you all for joining us today. It's such an important conversation. And we want to give you as much information in a short period of time as possible. Um, and then open for questions. So as I begin, um, as Assemblyman Berman mentioned, I am... I'm with Mission Hospice and Home Care, and I'm just going to start today by saying we all have a story. Everyone on this call has a story of the death or serious illness of a loved one. Um, many of us come to work in hospice and, and end-of-life care and planning 
um, because of our personal stories, as did I. Um, and this conversation and this awareness made a tremendous difference in my own mother's care at the end of her life, which led to my passion to raise this awareness. What I have learned over about 30 years now in two countries of working in and around end of life care is that humans aren't good predictors of the timing of life, of birth, or the timing of death. We each need each other in the middle, the beginning, the middle, and the end of our lives. And so much help is available, but we must ask for it. There are things that we have to learn about and take charge of, which is the theme of my presentation today in this area of our lives. And although 75% of you on this call already have an advanced directive, I hope I can add a little more information to you about how to make them and the conversations even more useful for you. And um, if you, like me, have had the experience of knowing what a loved one wanted or expressing that yourselves and being able to honor those wishes, it is a tremendous gift, both for the living and for the dying. And why is a hospice involved in raising this awareness? Um, a lot of times advanced care planning workshops come from hospitals or um, healthcare centers. And at Mission Hospice and Home Care, we've been serving both our uh, communities in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. We're one of the first nonprofit hospices in the state in Northern California. And for more than 40 years, we've been serving patients and families. And we believe that death is a human experience that touches every one of us. And we each deserve care at the end of our lives that's aligned with our beliefs, wishes, and values. But the only way to align that care is to know what matters most to you. And that's fundamentally in hospice, we ask what matters most to you. And in advanced care planning, we ask what matters most to you. So if you just keep that question in mind, um, Assemblyman Berman took a, a bit of my, uh, my statistic support here, but um, absolutely right. 90% people say talking about end of life is important, but fewer than 30% have done so. And even those of you who say you have an advanced directive, ask yourself, who knows you have it? And have you talked to them about it so that they understand what's in it and could support what your wishes are? 89% of doctors aren't comfortable starting this conversation. They are engaged in having it, many of them. Um, they are now reimbursed by Medicare for having an appointment to talk with you about it. Um, but to start it, you need to take that first step. And we recommend you take your advanced directive or your questions directly to your doctor. And COVID-19 in the last few years has certainly increased the awareness of the need for all of us to know what our wishes are in advance of a circumstance we could never have predicted. The other reason that people um, need to be aware of advanced directives is that actually in the state of California, there was a survey and over 70% of people would choose quality over quantity of life. Many people, as they approach the end, don't want to be kept alive artificially on machines or a lot of interventions. They would prefer to allow nature to take, take its course, live as comfortably as possible in their own home. But in today's medical society and, and the world that we live in, this option is you have to overtly not choose some of these artificial measures and choose instead palliative and hospice care. So very quickly, I'm just gonna give you the definitions of those and then go into the four steps of advanced care planning. Hospice and palliative care, there are so many myths around these. And because so many people would prefer to live their last days at home with support, that's exactly what hospice and palliative care do. They are expert care in the pain and symptom management through serious illness and the end of life. Palliative care in conjunction with other treatments after a serious diagnosis can support the stressors and the non-medical um, and medical interventions that can support alongside whether it's cardiology or oncology, the care and treatment that you're, you're receiving. And hospice care is palliative care, supportive comfort care delivered primarily in the last six months of life no one has a crystal ball, so sometimes more than six months. Um, it is a paid Medicare benefit. You have already paid for hospice care and people have myths about that. 
um, delivered to you where you are, in your own home, in a nursing home, in the hospital, and Mission Hospice in Redwood City um, has one of the only residential hospices as well in our two counties. So one myth to get rid of before we start advanced care planning is, is that if, if you are one of those people who would choose uh, quality over quantity of life to be kept comfortable at the end. But at a certain point, um, as even with my own mother, she said, is enough is enough. I know I, I'm going to go at some point and I've, I don't want any further treatments. Comfort care means we are still treating and caring for you. It's bringing the best of medicine when nature is going to take its course. So you can request palliative care. You can request hospice care. Even if your doctor doesn't bring it up, it's your right to ask and to know what's available to you. So advanced care planning, um, to raise this awareness of the need so that people know the need to ask and speak up and have their advanced directives in place, uh, Mission Hospice led a group and continues to work with a group of nonprofit uh, senior providers in the counties on an initiative called Take Charge. And we will put in the chat after this session, all of these materials are available to you free of charge in addition to a full video about um, a longer process. And we offer community workshops in this as well. So why do you need to take charge? Without clear direction, medical teams are required to do everything possible to sustain life. Sustaining life may not equal your definition of quality of life. It's easier to make hard decisions before instead of during a crisis. People always say they're just overwhelmed with the information, with the decisions, with the choices to be made. And planning ahead not only can help ensure that your wishes will be followed, but as Assemblyman Berman also said, that it can actually support people who live following the death of a loved one to know that they honored their wishes. So the process is four simple steps. It takes people some time to put these steps together in, in your own um, forms. And I will go through uh, briefly the forms, but in this session, so you know the things you really need to consider in completing your advanced directives. Step one is think about what matters most to you and what kind of care would you want if you were not able to speak for yourself? Most people think that, that in the healthcare service, if anything happened and they couldn't speak for themselves, whatever would be done would result in them having your current or better quality of life. But oftentimes there's a, there's a burden benefit to treatment options that can be given for any illness. And you need to define in your advanced directive what quality of life means to you. And some of the things um, in the Take Charge Toolkit that you can download on our website, it has a number of questions to consider. What does quality of life mean to you? What mattered most to you today in your life? Was it nature? Is it family? Is it friends? Is it being able to get up and go do something you want to be able to do? Are there spiritual or cultural um, needs that are really feed you. And that's part of what means quality of life to you. Are there medical decisions? And this is a whole arena, which in a very short period of time, Dr. Mayer will be able to go through some of the medical decisions that are your choices and options for care as you approach the end of life. All of those are the foundation about your values and what matters to you because no one has a crystal ball in unknown circumstances about what you might or might not need, but we can address what mattered to you, what your values were, and if the outcomes of treatments or care would be in alignment to your beliefs and values. So step one is critical to advanced care planning to align to what matters to you. Step two is talk, to your, talk about your wishes with your family, friends, and your doctor in part, so the more people that know what matters to you who are in your closest circle will be able to support you. Also, so that you can assess whether or not your doctor or care team are in alignment with your wishes, especially your medical wishes, and with your family and friends to help clarify for step three. Choosing your healthcare agent is the legal portion, the legally binding portion of an advanced directive in the state of California and nationally. 
Your healthcare agent is someone you'd want to make decisions about your care if you were unable to. They need to be somebody who knows what your wishes are, what your values are. They need to be someone that you can trust. And we recommend that it's someone that you know can speak up, advocate for you. I always say if someone you is a friend or a, a spouse that you would go to dinner with and they wouldn't return a meal if it was cold, they may not stand up for your health benefits either in, a, in an emergency or urgent situation with healthcare staff. So just consider who your healthcare agent is. And step four, write it down and document your decisions and your plans. In writing it down, there are a number of forms out there just to make it very confusing for the public. On our website, we have the California Advanced Healthcare Directive. That's a very basic state form. There's five wishes forms. Most of the healthcare services and systems in our um, county and counties have uh, may have their own online form. I know Kaiser does. So those are things that you can make sure that you're documenting it in a way that your health system um, will uh, honor and can go into their medical record system. You want to make sure you share your plan with your healthcare agent, your doctor, or any current health uh, folks who are treating you for care, your family and friends. And there are a couple of tools listed here. Um, the Advanced Healthcare Directive, Dear Doctor Letter, and the Conversation Starter Kit are all available and tools to help you share your plans with friends, family, and your doctors. And that toolkit is at www.missionhospice.org forward slash take charge. So with that very quick overview of advanced care planning, once you've completed them, you wanna make sure that your documents are either notarized or signed by two witnesses. You do not need an attorney to complete your advanced directives. You can complete them by yourself and have two people notarize and they're witnessing your signature, not the content of the document. When you've completed them and you've shared them um, and people know what matters most to you in a way that they could support your care if you couldn't speak for yourself, then on a regular basis, you want to review them. We've delivered workshops where people completed an advanced directive five or 10 years ago, and they may have named a healthcare agent who is no longer alive or is who, who is no longer part of the family or is no longer in the area or the country. And you may still choose a, a healthcare agent that is out of state or out of the country, but that can also make things a little more difficult in an emergency around um, time delays or differences in timing and being able to reach someone. So there's a lot of uh, a lot more information to cover about this, but these are the four key steps to help you get the care you want based on what matters to you. And the only time the advanced care plan is used is if you can't speak for yourself. It's like an umbrella or an insurance policy that those, that those around you and those responsible for your care in an emergency would be able to align your care to your wishes and values. And in my own story, I'd worked in end of life care for, for years. Um, my mother had an advanced directive and she had, had it there. Um, and I wasn't there in the end. I was traveling when my mother died, but she still got what she wanted. She had those who she wanted around her that she told she loved them. She lived around her last days in her home with her surroundings, her comforts and hospice and community around her. And it's part of my ongoing passion to share this message with you because her last gift to me was the freedom to make these choices in my own life. Mission Hospice and Home Care, we serve patients every day and their families. And most people think hospice means that you're just gonna die. And it actually means you have another care team around you. Remember what matters most to you, complete your advanced directives and talk about it. And we are here to support you and information is available on our website. Thank you so much. That was, that was fantastic. Mary, thank you so much uh, for that very informative 
uh, very comprehensive, but also really clear presentation um, and, and bringing it down to the four key steps. And then, um, you know, obviously the, the detail beneath each one. For everyone's reference, Mary's resources will be posted on my website uh, on this event's uh, webpage. So on, on my website, we have a web page for this event, and we're going to uh, include all the resources uh, that Mary just provided for us. Thanks again, Mary, and thank you for sticking around for Q&A. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I look forward to hearing the other speakers. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and speaking of other speakers, up next, we're fortunate to have Dr. Nilu Mera uh, with Kaiser Permanente. Dr. Mera, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me and thank you everyone for being here today. I'm going to share my screen really quick. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yep, looks great. Awesome. So um, thank you everybody for being here and this is so exciting and I'm so encouraged that assembly member has put this event together and this is very close to my heart. And just like, as Mary said, every life story begins with a personal story. And my mom who had died a very poor death back in India led me on this road and I'm a palliative care physician in Kaiser at Redwood City. And this has become my life mission and passion. So I'm gonna share a little bit about, Mary has already talked about advanced directives in She's already talked about how to create them and how to do them. I see, I'm very fortunate to see here that 70% of us already have those in place. So yay to everyone. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about why is it important that we have them because every what has a why behind them. And it is important for us to understand and know because from a medical team's perspective, how we treat them, how, how we look at them, and how we honor your wishes or not is equally important. So who makes choices for you when you can't make for them is very important, as Mary said. And what do you really want? What's important to you? Who are you as a person? And when treatments were becoming scarce or we were not, we didn't have any more treatments to offer, what would become most important thing for you? So these advanced directives, they give you an opportunity to talk with your family, your friends, and above all, your treatment team, which is your doctors, about how you want treatments to be guided when there are not too many left to be tried. Your family members don't have to guess what would you have wanted, what should we do in this situation. And believe me, I see patients every day where families have not talked about it, now the patient is not able to speak for himself and family members are in a guilt trip and they do not know. These are the hardest decision anybody can make in those times. And um, above more importantly, to know what your family members were going through it, your mom, your dad, your spouse, or your friends, they would want for themselves. So they, we are not playing a guessing game. Planning in life is important. You have planned for your career, you've planned your marriage, you have decided when you want to be parents, you, you guided your children through their life, education, finances, life celebrations, everything took planning and time. And so should old age, your commitment to stay healthy, eating good food, exercising, creating healthy habits. We do them naturally, but planning for our death, we hesitate. We don't really talk about it. We still consider that a taboo. I think it's time that we have those open discussions and what a better teacher than, than the pandemic that we all have faced has taught us so many lessons. So one thing that's certain in life is that life is uncertain and to plan for the uncertainty is the most important gift that you can give for yourself. Life can throw curveballs at any time. If we are born today, like I say to my patients, we all came with an expiration. We don't get to choose whether I'm going to die or not, the only choice that I get to make, am I going to die in peace and dignity surrounded by my loved ones or I'm gonna suffer through it and have 20 tubes ticking out of me and with the alarms and bells around me. That's the only choice we get to make. So completing an advanced directive is really an act of love as was beautifully put by Lucy Colnevi, whose husband, Paul, who had written a book um, uh, 
had said he was he was a 32 year old guy who was a neurosurgeon and who was has aspirations in life and was going to do big things in life and here he was struggling with lung cancer and dying and the biggest gift that Lucy said that he gave him was to tell her what was most important to him and how far should she go if he was not able to get better so updating these documents every so often, every 10 years is recommended because life events do happen. If we chose a decision maker, he may have passed on before us or things may have happened to, uh, health conditions may have happened that they're not in a position to make decisions. So re-looking at those at certain intervals is extremely important. These conversations are very, very difficult conversations to have. And certainly we don't have them on the dinner table. And most importantly, we think nothing is going to happen to me. I'm invincible. Maybe something will happen to my neighbor or to the person on the street. It'll always be someone else. It takes only one event to pivot your life. So if it'll happen, we will talk about it. We keep thinking, okay, I, I can wait. When it happens, I'll have plenty of time to, to talk about it and, and discuss it. And we're very uncomfortable. We, we don't want to talk about things that make us uncomfortable. What, how to even start these conversations is sometimes it is difficult because we feel that our loved ones will think and they would not want to talk about it. But why is talking so important? It's important because the number one emotion that we leave this world with is regret. We regret that we didn't mend our relationships that had gone sour throughout our lives. We don't tell our family and friends that we do care. We regret that we did not, we, we will not be remembered as we would like to be remembered. We're not able to say, I love you. Thank you for doing what you did for me. I forgive you and I'm so sorry that if I did anything that hurt you in the process. Leaving family members with unanswered questions is the biggest regret that we leave this world with. And being a palliative care physician, I see this a lot and it, it, is, it is very sad to watch. Like Mary said, you have to define what is quality for you. For me, it may mean going all the way and fighting all the way, even if it means machines. For you, it may mean I want to be home. So we want to cater to what you want and not have a guessing game at the end of your life where things may go not according to what you want. What is most important to you should be visible to us through these documents so that we can actually serve you based on how you want to be served. And if cure was not an important, it was not an option, what would be in your bucket list? What would be important for you to pay attention to? And is your family aware of your choices or not is the biggest question. It is the biggest gift, like Mary said, you leave for your family by telling them what's important and what are your biggest fears and worries that they should attend to when you're not able to speak for yourself. Now, shifting to the healthcare world, how we physicians look at these situations, you're asked, you're, made, you're asked to make choices, some choices you don't even understand. I don't know how many of you guys have read the book from Atul Gawande, um, Being Mortal. He talks about his own dad when he was presented the options of choosing chemotherapy options. And he said, being a physician himself, that was the hardest decision. And he did not know what to do. Because you know what, when it's your loved one, when it's you in those shoes, your brain does not work when the crisis is looming on you. You have to think through these options when you can, when you have the ability to look at them objectively. No one in the healthcare will make it for you. We offer you treatments. We have anything or everything to offer and we can keep doing things to you till the end. They may not be meaningful. We may not be able to guarantee you that you would be coming back to or restoring back to what your quality of life was or what you were able to do even close to it. We measure success by you were not moving your arm yesterday, now you, you're moving your arm. We don't look at what did you want if Everything, if the treatments were to stop today, what was the outcome that you were looking for? 
we so it's important to make those informed choices to understand them well know what's ahead of you and more importantly i cannot emphasize it enough to let your treatment team and your loved ones know so that they don't survive with the guilt of guessing what you would have wanted so some fun facts like 75% of the Americans would like to be home at the end of their life. But only 80% of us, we uh, uh, actually the 80% of us die in a hospital instead. So why do you think that disconnect is? Is it our cutting edge technology? Is our system failing us? Or is it our notion of immortality that we have discomfort in accepting death? Or we just are not comfortable having these discussions or conversations. As physicians, we are very reluctant. We are just not able to tell you that, you know what, I may not have anything meaningful to offer you. This may be the end of the game here, but we didn't take the oaths to tell you that we are giving up on you. We keep fighting till there's nothing left in us to fight and nothing left in you to fight. But we overestimate prognosis for any patient by a factor of seven. And I'm going to stop there for a second because that's huge. If you had seven weeks to live, we could tell you you have seven months to live. Some of it is the prognostic uncertainty in medicine that we just can't predict with certainty. Nobody has a crystal ball. But also our clinicians fear of giving up on you because we want you to do well as much as you want to do well yourself, but we do have limitations. And accepting those limitations is the key. So what is the consequences of these treatments that we offer? We, what we end up doing, we don't focus on alleviating symptoms. We don't focus on treating you as a person who would want to be in a certain way, but you become a medical record number. And we just keep doing those things to you because it's hard for us to accept that there's nothing that we can do for you. So urgently, what we do is we call palliative care, which should have been called, like Mary said, palliative care comes with when you are diagnosed with medical conditions, whether it's oncological conditions, heart situation, lung, kidney, liver, what palliative care does, it's an interdisciplinary team. It has a holistic approach to care. We're able to coordinate care between the different providers that give you different informations. We are able to provide care from psychosocial perspective, from spiritual perspective, and also uh, more importantly, alleviating the symptom distress. You are able to tolerate your treatments better if palliative care is, is walking alongside you. And in fact, it prolongs life by at least three months. There's a article that has come out where lung cancer patients were looked at, and they actually lived three months longer when they had palliative care supporting them in their journey. So this is your right, like Mary said, and you can ask for it. Every insurance covers it. You may may not be told about this. You may not be aware of it, but it's your right to ask for a team that can help and support you. And hospice, as Mary said, that it is, if two physicians think that you have a life expectancy of six months or less, that's when you qualify for hospice. But a lot of patients live longer. In fact, you live three weeks longer with hospice versus coming in and out of the hospital. It's a fully covered benefit, but nationally only patients live for only a week when hospice cannot offer all the services that they can to optimize your quality of life. I had a patient who had lung cancer and who um, said, I didn't want, I don't want any more chemotherapy. She was in hospice and she lived for a year. And throughout the year, when I talked to her, she would often wonder, I feel so good. Do, are you sure I have cancer? Of course, when the end came, it came very suddenly and she died very peacefully. But what a gift to have that a whole year, which she could live with great quality of life. So the life tools that I, they're close to my heart and Kaiser has this advanced healthcare directive. We offer it online so that it becomes part of your medical record system. You can submit it online to us. You can drop it off to your doctor's office or member services. 
And it's, I cannot emphasize enough how important this is. I had a 22 year old recently who was dying in the hospital. There was no business for a 22 year old to die. And my heart went out to the parents who were dealing with it. She was supposed to graduate. But like I said, life does throw curveballs. You know, that 22 year old had the wherewithal to tell her parents that if I cannot talk to my friends, if I cannot go walk with them on the beach, I do not want to be on life support. And she died peacefully at her home with her parents by her side. And then the, the POLS form that you guys probably are aware of, which is the Physician's Order for Life Sustaining Treatment, that is very important to document your wishes about how CPR should be, is, is of course, CPR is always available to you. How effective is it? It is not like what we watch on TV. CPR is very minimally effective. And most patients with chronic health conditions and advanced illnesses only survive 1% of the time. So it's important to have these discussions ahead of time. And for example, I had an 83-year-old patient in the hospital who had not had these discussions. We could not locate his family. We didn't know who would be able to make decisions for him. Finally, we were able to locate an estranged daughter who was not comfortable making decisions on his behalf. We did not have a pulse wrong. We did not have an advanced directive. He suffered for six months and ultimately did die, but that was not a dignified death at all. So to avoid these things from happening and taking the control back, like Mary said, taking charge of your condition is the way to go and having these discussions proactively and actually instigating it with your physicians and your providers and say, I want to have these discussions and I want to have advanced directive. I want to fill out my pulse form. So with that, thank you again for having me. And it was a pleasure being here and talking to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mara, uh, for that, that really enlightening and, and, and informative presentation. And you actually touched upon a couple of issues that some folks have mentioned in the chat. Uh, that that we'll get to when we get to the Q&A section. Before we get to the Q&A section, I did want to mention, I've learned uh, if anyone is having trouble viewing the YouTube comments, try reloading the site. So if you're watching this, some folks are watching this on Zoom, some folks are watching this on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube and you're having trouble viewing the, the YouTube comments, try reloading the site um, and that may, might uh, solve any problems you might be having with the YouTube comments. Our next speaker is someone who I've had the pleasure of working with in Sacramento, Patricia McGinnis, Executive Director of California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform. Thank you, Pat, for taking the time to speak to my constituents this afternoon. Thank you, Assemblymember Berman, and for sponsoring this seminar. And also want to thank Isabel for her patience. Um, I didn't prepare a lot of PowerPoints because almost everything I've been asked to talk about is on our website and I was gonna share that. Um, California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform, I founded in 1983, if you can believe it, um, mostly to try to improve the quality of care and quality of life for nursing home residents. Uh, we went statewide in 1990 and now we deal with all kinds of issues, including durable powers of attorney, healthcare directives, things like that. I can tell you, that those who are most susceptible to um, scams, to elder financial abuse and to elder abuse are people who do not have trusted agents, trusted uh, people who, uh, and caregivers. When they are in a nursing home, for example, or in a hospital, you need an advocate. And usually that's uh, the person that you put down as your agent under a, uh, or a surrogate decision maker. <clears throat> We're, uh, we, are, uh, we have the only statewide state bar certified lawyer referral service in California, specifically addressing issues for seniors, including estate planning for long-term care, estate planning in general, elder abuse, elder financial abuse, and we actually have a specialized lawyer referral service panel for elder financial abuse issues. Um, I've been asked to provide an overview of elder financial abuse scams, estate planning resources, improper estate planning resources, nursing home considerations, and canner resources. All of that, by the way, is on our website, and I'll try to pull that up. But I want to talk about elder financial abuse first. 
Again, as I said, if you don't have a trusted relative or a trusted agent or a durable power of attorney, uh, people are much more susceptible to elder financial abuse. Um, there's one out of 10 older adults is abused every year in terms of uh, physical abuse, particularly in institutions when you don't have an essential caregiver. Um, one out of five older adults are swindled every year. Uh, we, we, it is estimated that uh, as few as one out of every 44 cases of elder abuse is actually reported to authorities for many reasons. First of all, many people are too embarrassed to even admit to their own relatives or to their husbands or wives and their kids that, gee, I've been swindled. But what we're seeing um, for elder financial abuse, theft and scams can take on many guises and we see it every single day. Unauthorized access to accounts. You have a caregiver, you trust that person to uh, write a, a check out and uh, then all of a sudden your money is gone. Forged signatures, misuse or theft of money or possessions. Uh, coercive or deceit into signing documents. And this just happened recently when a, a gentleman thought he was getting his trust revised and it turned out he actually uh, bought an annuity that he didn't know he bought. Um, you gain trust through living trust mills and free lunch seminars. I'm sure you've seen those things all the time. Uh, living trust, $499.95. That used to be the limit, uh, $500 was the limit for a felony. And now uh, it's, of course it's gone up. But you see these things all the time. You get a free lunch, you get a free piece of pie, and you get to get a living trust. And the trust is delivered by an annuity salesperson who tries to talk the person into buying an annuity that they usually don't need. Um, the improper use of conservatorship, guardianship, or powers of attorney. Those things happen all the time. Um, you give a nephew your uh, power of attorney and that person becomes your agent and that person gets access to your bank accounts, et cetera. So we, we advise people to be very, very careful. Um, the sale of an inappropriate insurance or annuity policies that people actually don't need. And then we have a lot, we have a whole project around real estate scams, <clears throat> predatory lending, mortgage flipping, reverse mortgages. Um, some are wonderful for people, uh, but some are very unsuitable. And we got legislation that created a reverse mortgage suitability worksheet that needs to be provided to people when they do do a reverse mortgage. Um, unlawful foreclosures, solar scams, and timeshare scams. Those are, those are big. Now we're also seeing a number of others, particularly during the pandemic, the lottery scams. Uh, we won the Publishers Clearinghouse. I remember when I first started this organization many years ago, um, a gentleman called and he was so excited. He uh, won the uh, Publishers Clearinghouse and he was able to now pay to get his wife out of the nursing home and bring her home. When of course he didn't win at all. Um, everybody's a winner in these kinds of things, but they have to send cash to pay for the taxes and fees. And again, he found out that it was really just a scam. At least we were able to advise him not to send any money. Um, charity scams. So you get phone solicitations for donations to support various schools or various underprivileged children in other countries. And then the sweetheart scam that's become particularly popular during the pandemic. You meet someone on a dating site and this new love wants to move to the United States, but needs all kinds of money in order to do so. Um, we've had children call and say, what am I going to do? My father wants to send this woman money and she lives in you know, Europe or you know, in uh, Southeast Asia or someplace like that. There's whole, not a whole lot you can do unless that person is conserved. If that person has capacity, they have the right and the thing is, we have to remember that you are considered competent unless adjudicated otherwise. Unless there's a conservatorship, you are considered competent. So if your father is competent, i.e. has capacity, decides to send all his money to a sweetheart you know, over in Europe, there's not a lot you can do except to file for conservatorship. Um, so those are some of the scams that we see. And one of the things that we do is, as I said, we just did a webinar yesterday for attorneys in California. Um, we had 73 people who signed up for it going over financial abuse scams. And they're, um, they're willing to take on cases 
not, you know, $50 that your nephew ripped off, that's not going to, you're not going to get an attorney to go after that. But you can get advice of how to protect yourself. I, uh, we also have a lot of estate planning resources. We get thousands of calls every month and thousands of emails every month, mostly about elder abuse, either in institutions or elder financial abuse. We have a great many calls about Medi-Cal and Medi-Cal planning. My mother had a stroke, she's in the hospital. They're saying that she needs to go into a nursing home. How do I pay for this? You know, nursing home costs like $10,000 a month or more in California, sometimes 12, 15,000. How are you gonna pay for it? And to be able to understand what your rights are in terms of um, when you come out of the hospital, you go into a nursing home. If you've been on Medicare, in Medicare in the acute care hospital, then Medicare will pay for up to 100 days in the skilled nursing facility. Usually you don't get 100 days, you usually get about 23 under Medicare. Um, but we can advise you and walk you through the process and also how to uh, access the Medi-Cal program, particularly to pay for long-term care. Um, in terms of estate planning resources, we tell people beware uh, of, uh, we only go to a qualified attorney when, who are up to date on current law. We see constantly people who do trusts that are not funded. We see people who are transferring property when it's not, not necessary anymore in California. Um, we see the bait and switch where you're, oh, I'm gonna update your trust and here you bought it. Anymore. So those things are very, very important for people to understand. If, if it has to do with Medi-Cal, you can always call Canner. I'm going to uh, try to get onto our website now. Should I share my screen and then do that? Yes, that, that'd be great. Thanks, Pat. Okay, hang on. Let me see if I can do that. Um, bring it up. My counter presentation. Well, I can't do it. Isabel, can you do that? Bring it up. I don't know why I can't do it, but I apologize. No problem. Looks like it's it's coming up right now. There it is. Okay. Am I able to access it? Is it live? Pat, just let me know what you'd like me to do and I'll- I want I'll to show our consumer, our free consumer fact sheets. Well, you can see at the top, nursing homes, all kinds of information about nursing homes, what to look for, how to evaluate, same with residential care, assisted living, continuing care retirement communities, Medi-Cal for long-term care, um, elder abuse and elder financial abuse, and how to find an elder law attorney. In terms of the consumer fact sheets, uh, over here on the uh, left-hand side. Free consumer fact sheets. You will see all of the different fact, you know, what is a nursing home in California? How to choose a nursing home? We tell people, you know, it, during the pandemic, it was very difficult. People couldn't even visit. Uh, we've had 10,000 nursing home residents who died in nursing homes during the pandemic in California. And if somebody came out of an acute care hospital, went into a nursing home, their relatives weren't even able to visit for over almost two years now. Um, things have changed, of course, but, um, but that's very important for to go and visit that particular nursing home and make sure it's a suitable place. Make sure it's close to you. Make sure that your uh, social network is close by. Uh, we have a nursing home evaluation checklist uh, all of this other information about what to look for in a nursing home and how to advocate for good care. Again, um, these are very important. One of the most important things are family members and essential caregivers and family councils. Same with residential care for the elderly. Those are assisted living. Every assisted living in California is uh, licensed as a residential care facility for the elderly an RCFE. We've got 7,400 of these facilities in California, uh, a great many. 70% of the um, thousands of people who live in RCFEs actually live in uh, facilities with 100 or plus beds. And we've got 70% of those 7,400 facilities 
are actually six or fewer beds. So we have a lot of small facilities. And when you're looking for a residential care, those are the things you wanna keep in mind. Um, so you'll see searching for a residential care. Um, I never met anybody who said, I can't wait till I'm 90 years old and I get to go into a nursing home. Uh, most people, as has been mentioned by our previous speakers, wanna be able to stay at home. So we have a lot of community resources too about uh, home and community-based resources. And that's one of the things that we've been advocating for for a number of years. We need better access to home and community-based services. The state spends 60,000 plus a year for people on Medi-Cal to stay in nursing homes. Um, and we don't, we don't even spend half of that for people to be able to stay at home. Um, in terms of um, planning for long-term care, we've got all kinds of fact sheets on Medi-Cal. Uh, what's eligible, what's not, um, how you can access the aged and disabled program, how you can access home and community-based services, and then the elder abuse fact sheets are very important as well. Um, most of all, we have, um, okay, you see our incapacity planning for it now, planning for long-term care. We have a sample durable power of attorney for property and a sample healthcare directive as well. So all of this information is on our website. Most of these fact sheets are also translated into Spanish and Chinese. And so you can just download them, or if you don't, if you don't have that capacity, you can call our 800 number. Can we go back to the front page? The home page. Um, you see our, oh, let's go down um, where our, where, <laughs> Where's our, our, yeah, it's not very big, but we do have an 800 number. Let's go to um, the, the um, PowerPoint. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Just the front page of the PowerPoint. Um, there we go. Um, to speak to an advocate, you can call an 800 number. If you have questions about any of the issues that we've talked about, you can give a call to our 800 number in California. We have one about seven or eight advocates now. We just hired some new ones um, who can answer your questions, who can help guide you. Uh, but the 800 number, that's the one where that most people call. You can also send an email request. Uh, if you have a question about nursing homes, residential care, uh, any of the issues that we've discussed, you can email us and we will usually respond within 24 hours. And then you can find consumer information, all those fact sheets and all other kinds of information at our website at www.canner.org. Um, it's information on elder abuse, elder financial abuse, uh, all of the things that we just went through. And uh, I urge you to follow the advice of the other presenters. Have a uh, healthcare directive. Make sure that you do that. And I'll tell you one of the reasons. We filed a lawsuit because uh, for unrepresented residents in nursing homes, um, who was making their decisions? The, uh, the facility was making those decisions. And sometimes they're making the decision as to whether that person was gonna live or die, whether they were gonna get palliative care or not. Um, we won the lawsuit because the judge found it to be unconstitutional, that their rights were being violated. And now the state has set up a patient representative form that we're working with them to help establish so that everybody will have a representative in the final days of their life. You can avoid this by uh, doing a healthcare directive. It's one of the most important things that you can do because otherwise, who's making those decisions for you? The other one, of course, is to avoid scams, et cetera. Make sure that you have a trusted agent for a durable power of attorney. Those things are incredibly important. And for anything else, you can give us a call. If it has to do with Medi-Cal particularly, if it has to do with nursing home abuse or residential care abuse or elder financial abuse, you can always give us, call our 800 number or email us. Anyway, that's it. That was that was a lot. That was great. I know. I know. That's it's a lot. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much, Pat. I, I really appreciate the the presentation, the sometimes sobering presentation. I'm I'm often amazed and discouraged by how creative people get to scam us out of our 
out of our money, out of our property, um, especially when we're at our most vulnerable times. So, uh, you we're know, amazed and discouraged at our office, but we're not cynical or we wouldn't be doing this work. Believe and, me. And we're grateful that you are. There's well, always hope. Yeah. Yes. Couldn't agree with you more. Couldn't agree with you more. Thank you, Pat. And thanks for sticking around. Oh, uh, absolutely. We'll have some questions real soon. And we're going to share, be sure to put the links to the resources that you mentioned on, on the website, on my website as well. Um, our last speaker is Gina Sanchez, who is Bureau Chief Cal of the California Cemetery and Funeral Bureau. Gina, thank you so much for joining us today. The Zoom is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Assembly Member Berman. I am excited to be here. Um, I will be sharing my screen here. Okay, so um, thank you, everyone. I am, my name is Gina Cheverini Sanchez. As stated, I'm the Chief of the Cemetery and Funeral Bureau since February 2019. You'll hear me call it CFB or um, just the Bureau through my, through my spiel here. I'm very grateful to be here today. I hope you find my presentation um, useful and relevant. The, uh, the ultimate, oh, my, my click's not working. There we go. Um, the ultimate responsibility of the Cemetery and Funeral Bureau for the state of California is consumer protection under the Cemetery and Funeral Act. That's the set of laws that govern uh, several different occupations within the death care industry. Um, a lot of this discussion today has been um, how to care for you and your loved ones as you come at, during those um, during those times getting close to death. I'm here today to kind of talk, well, what happens after that? Who then is in charge? Who has to come in? Um, what can you do yourself? What do you need a licensed individual to help you with? And where do you go if you have problems, uh, concerns, think there's been a violation of law in, in dealing with licensees? So um, the licensees, speaking of them, they are our funeral homes throughout the state, crematories, privately owned cemeteries. So not every cemetery is under the jurisdiction of the Bureau. And, um, and many of the employees that are in that business. As part of our mandate of consumer protection, there are several recommendations I'm gonna to make today, very similar to what you've already been hearing. Um, and, and it's important to make these decisions in, an, in, in a competitive marketplace, um, informed decisions, all the while dealing with an uncomfortable topic and at times, if you don't plan ahead, then you're dealing with it while you're going through the grieving process, which, as we all know, can be a very uh, difficult time, uh, a very easy time for those to get to, to be taken advantage of. Um, so it's it's really important, like we've been saying, to to plan ahead. So where exactly where exactly do you begin um, when you're speaking about what happens to you after you pass? So obviously we, we recommend planning ahead. A personal death plan can be difficult to think about and it can come with some hard decisions. Even now deciding about your final disposition can be a process. California is one of the very few states that have multiple forms of final disposition. So the one that we all know about of course is full body burials in a cemetery um, or cremation. Those are two forms of final disposition. However, the Bureau has now licensed its first hydrolysis facility, which is more commonly known out there as water cremation. And this past legislative session, reduction uh, will be implemented in January 2027. You may have been hearing a little bit about reduction in the news recently. Uh, reduction speeds up the natural decomposition of human remains through a process used with straw, soil, and other natural materials that speed up the, de the decomposition process. And what is left is about three cubic feet of soil that can be legally spread in a forest, for example, uh, very similar to cremated remains. I would, I would like to take a moment to mention that this is not considered human composting as I have been hearing in the media. Um, it's unfortunate that that is what is being told to consumers right now, that is not the case. Composting is overseen by the Environmental Protection Agency it's highly regulated, and it is a process, a safe process used to grow plants. So reduction is not composting. It is simply an alternative way for someone's final disposition. The soil that is at the end that you get is still considered remains, just like with cremation. So 
So once you've made that decision, you know, which, which way, what is, if you're interested, if you may already have a plot somewhere um, through family members, you may want cremation, where do you want to be spread? These kind of final disposition questions are, are kind of where you want to start. After that, you're going to need to consider, do you want to, do you want to service? Do you want to be interred in a cemetery, um, in a mausoleum? Uh, do you want to be spread somewhere? So no matter what you decide, the Bureau recommends putting it in writing, whether that's in a will or whether that's just a piece of paper written down, um, it is up to you. But the most important part is sharing it with your loved ones and keeping a copy that would be accessible immediately after death. A lot of times we make these plans, we even get into contracts with funeral homes, and then they're put in a safety deposit box that the loved ones can't easily access. It takes time to get in there. Maybe they don't know where it is. Um, and then those decisions are just left amongst, you know, whoever the next of kin is, which I'll talk about in just a moment. So you can have it in your safety deposit box, but have a copy with, with the next of kin or who, who your power of attorney is or who you designated to have in charge of your final disposition. Have a copy in your desk drawer somewhere where someone can easily access and your family knows where that is. Um, so today I'm here to talk about some ways to protect yourself when you've kind of made those initial decisions and are now seeking a funeral home or cemetery services. You can either do that ahead of time, which is what I'm here to recommend, um, or you, which is called a pre-need because it's ahead of time, pre-need, or if you're seeking these services recently for somebody who has passed, which is called an at need. So separately from going through a funeral home or a licensee with the Bureau, it, it, I, I would like to mention that home death care is legal in California. So that is caring for your loved one at home after they've passed until their final disposition, whether that's to the crematory, the cemetery, the hydrolysis facility. So this is not common, but if you would like to go through the necessary steps required by each county for getting your death certificate, final disposition permit, and transporting your loved one, whether yourself or calling a transportation company, transporting them to the cemetery or crematory directly, that's entirely up to you. Um, as I said, however, this is uncommon. It takes a lot of work with the family members and you must consider the condition of your loved one. Um, so if you prefer to bring in a third party to oversee those permits, transportation, all that stuff, uh, then you will need to work with a licensed funeral establishment and a licensed funeral director or its employees. So although this may not be the norm uh, when it comes to this topic, it is very normal in every other aspect of our life. The Bureau suggests shopping around for your funeral home or your cemetery if you don't already have um, a contract there or if you don't know where to go. Uh, you use your resources, use your friends and family, use your community members, maybe your church, um, but I also recommend going to our website. Up on the screen now is our homepage. You will see right here this button called Verify. That purple button will get you to our license lookup screen. So we suggest starting by finding your local funeral homes. You can go to this advanced search button and look just directly in your county. Maybe you know the, the business name that you want to look at. And Looking through here, you can, you can find out your funeral homes, your local funeral homes, your local cemeteries. You can go on the websites and start looking at their goods and services and start comparing. What is it that is important to you in the, in the service? What is it that is important to you in the location? Um, is it just pricing that's important to you? Uh, those kinds of things can't always be found on the website, but if they do have a website, uh, and their goods and services will be listed. However, it is not yet required by law to have prices listed. So if you are researching online, you can contact them in person or by phone, and it is required by law that the funeral establishment give you a price list immediately upon discussing funeral goods and services. So they, not sh they should not be engaging in conversations with you without first giving you that price list. Um, so there's also, let's find the name. Okay, five still. There's also a wealth of free information available online. For example, AARP has an article titled What to Do When a Loved One Dies. Um, another one titled Smart Ways to Cover the Costs of a Funeral. So there are resources out there that not only 
do you have to make the decisions you know, under this jurisdiction of cemetery and funeral final disposition? But there's also those other things you need to take care of, business accounts, mail, um, you know, is, is there any payable on death uh, accounts that they have? Um, Social Security and all of those other steps that must also be taken care of. Once this immediate time has been has been taken care of by your family um, or your loved ones. So right now, the average cost of a funeral, according to the Foresight Company, is seventy eight hundred dollars, seven thousand eight hundred dollars in average. And so, planning in advance, researching can not only help you keep the costs down, but can also ensure that you have the services that you want. So there's a couple of ways that consumers can um, plan in advance, not just plan, planning what you want, but also do you want to make the plan and pay in advance? This is called a pre-need to pay in advance of your funeral or cemetery services. Uh, and it is a legal contract between you and the funeral establishment that details out the goods and services you collect, you, you've selected. And most likely it has to say in the contract that it guarantees the pricing. So even as time goes on and the prices of this urn or the prices of this service have gone up, your contract will guarantee the pricing. I'm gonna to speak to that um, a little bit more because as you're filling out a paperwork with a, with a funeral home, you're, we encourage you to make sure all, um, all that your requests, everything that you're talking about is in writing. Ask those questions whatever they are burning inside. Do you have enough room to have, you know, 50 people for my service? Um, I need to separately pay for cemetery services to open and close the grave if I prepay for a plot. There's things that you can ask during the process before you sign the contract. With any contract, make sure you know exactly what you're signing. So bring someone in if you can't. Bring a loved one. Sometimes you're going through an at need process and it's overwhelming. So having that third person there with you, helping you through these decisions, making sure you're signing exactly what you're asking for, exactly what the two of you or whoever you're working with, funeral ranger is talking about. So there's different ways to, to fund a pre-need. If you want to pay in advance to alleviate some of that um, monetary burden on your loved ones, there are multiple ways to fund a pre-need. The most common is of course an insurance policy. You can get into an insurance policy a lot of times directly with the funeral establishment. You may have insurance, you know, AAA insurance or something like that, that you can reach out to them and talk to, talk to them on a payable on death insurance policy. Um, you can also get a payable on death savings account. You can also authorize the money to, for the funeral establishment that you, of your choosing to put it in their trust fund um, and pull out when it becomes at need. So make sure you know where your money is going once you sign that line and get into a contract with the funeral establishment. Um, ask them about the cancellation policy. By law, there is a cancellation policy. Uh, they do keep a certain percentage of the income earned if it was in a trust fund, um, but otherwise you get you know, the rest of that money back. And, uh, but as with any contract, CFB recommends that you review the contract before you sign it Anything that you discussed that they committed to do or perform should be notated and listed out on the contract. By law, it is required that the funeral contract lists out everything. It's not just one big, your funeral and this big cost. It must all be itemized out on your contract. So don't sign it until you are 100% comfortable with that contract. So it's not a, you walk in somewhere, start talking to someone, and it's high pressure and you have to sign right now, right then. You have the right to decide if that is the contract you wanna get into or you can walk away and go to the next funeral. So be sure to discern whether this will cover all the services requested. There are times where the contract won't cover if you're doing it ahead of time, maybe the flowers. So that may be some, a little additional money that the family will have to come up with at the end. Or maybe that can be included in this contract, but be sure to ask those questions. What's not covered here? What will my family have to come you know, to the table with to make sure my, my wishes are, are fully executed? So there still may um, 
be additional things even that you can't plan for, additional death certificates, um, splitting ashes. A lot of times uh, funeral homes will split ashes into keepsakes, smaller urns, necklaces, and so on. Uh, the reception hall or flowers, as I said, and then um, at times there's additional fees at the end of opening and closing the, the cemetery vaults if the cemetery you chose does that um, and so on. So finally, keep a copy of the contract uh, with your loved ones, easily accessible and share the information. And specifically who your next of kin is. There is a law who determines who is the next of kin and it does go in a very specific order. Uh, according to law, the, uh, your next of kin is the person who has the final say for your final disposition. So be sure that if you do not want it to be your legal next of kin, which is your spouse, um, it goes then to adult children, parents, sibling, then you need to put in a power of attorney designating who controls your final disposition. So the order according to the law is power of attorney first, then spouse, adult children, parents, siblings and then it goes down from there. Additionally, the law states if your next of kin does not act within a certain time frame, then the funeral establishment can start going down the list to the next of kin to determine who, uh, to determine the final disposition of your loved one. The next of kin does not necessarily have to be the one paying any of the additional monies or paying for the funeral itself. Someone else can pay the next of kin uh, it doesn't have to have that burden. But if the next of kin does not act and doesn't get the money or sign the at need contract and making sure this is moving forward, then the funeral home can move down the list by law. Um, so I think the most common issue we get here, hearing from funeral homes, is that um, family members cannot agree. Once it passes down to adult children, or if it gets down to siblings, there's seven siblings and they can't, they can't agree. If that's the case and it's taking a little too long, uh, there is law that allows the funeral establishment to ask you to go to court to get a judge to determine who the, the next, next of kin is. This actually becomes more common uh, than you think. Uh, the fighting over, you know, whether you're cremated, whether you're full body burial, who gets the, who pays, who gets the urn, um, it can be a very emotional conversation and there, there can be a lot of angst in between family members at this time. So putting this in writing, sharing it with everybody really allows that smoother transition and getting your family into that grieving process um, and really getting to whether it's a celebration or a very formal um, funeral, wherever, wherever your wishes lie, it's a much easier transition for your family. So the Bureau does put out a few publications. The resources, of course, will be available um, as Assemblymember Berman has mentioned. So the one on the screen here, this is called the Consumer Guide to Cemetery and Funeral Purchases. And it is our most robust publication. Uh, we also have a few uh, brochures that, um, that I've also provided the resources for. Currently, the Cemetery and Funeral Pur Purchases uh, Guide, it was revised in 2013. We are going through a, um, a revision and, excuse me, we expect the new um, revision to be out early next year. These are uh, available in every funeral establishment in California. So uh, the consumer guide uh, should be released, as I said, um, early next year, and it is does have a lot more details than, than what I've gone, gone in today. So, Finally, just some um, tips and some common questions, because I didn't have too much time, I could go on and on forever, is that in addition to comparing prices at funeral homes, comparing prices at cemeteries as well, um, the location of where your plot is, if you want to be in a mausoleum, if you want to niche in your urn, I mean, these are all decisions that, um, that you have to make and, and comparing prices and services at cemeteries as well. And asking about their maintenance standards, you know, a cemetery is for, forever. What is their plan in perpetuity for maintenance of, of, your, of your area that you're choosing? Um, funeral and cemetery goods and services are separate. They are two different licensees. A lot of times when you're dealing with the funeral home, however, they will include the cemetery that they work with and include that in your pricing. So that's not um, uncommon, but uh, they can 
funeral homes can say, no, you have to go separately to the cemetery um, to make any of those additional purchases. So if during the course of an interaction with a licensee during one of these times, or you, or you suspect unlicensed activity, you can file a complaint with the Bureau. We, um, this is our homepage again, cfb.ca.gov. Right here, it says filing a complaint, this button here. So um, when filing when filing a complaint, we, we ask that you submit all your documentation, any emails back and forth, text messages back and forth, a copy of whatever they gave you after the contract, hopefully it's full, the full contract, um, submitting all of that. And you can do that via mail or it is an electronic process to file a complaint. Um, when submitting all the documentation, that helps aid in our investigation and a representative will contact you for an interview. You, can't, you do have the option of filing uh, anonymously. However, this sometimes does make it difficult if we don't have basic information of the decedent name, we won't know what contract to pull, um, et cetera. So if it is anonymous, please try to provide as much detail as possible, um, including your, your statement. Um, so filing complaint is easy, but if you have any questions um, at any point in time, if you're just need to learn how to help you with, walk you through the license lookup and find funeral homes in your area, we, um, we try to answer our phones live. Uh, we also have a designated person responding to emails, and we are under the Department of Consumer Affairs, who also has a consumer information center. So this is uh, all the ways you can contact us and get more information on this in this whole area. Um, that does, oh, and follow us on Facebook. Uh, we did just open up a Facebook uh, last year or so, uh, maybe sometime during COVID season. We're working on becoming more active on it, but that is definitely where we post, where we have our, our public meetings, any new laws that come through, um, so on and so forth. We, we try to be as active as possible. Uh, also the Department of Consumer Affairs, that's my umbrella agency over the Bureau, and they are over all occupational licensing here in the state of California. So follow them on Facebook. You will get updates um, from everywhere from medical board to, con to to contractors, automotive repair, and then of course, CFB. So that is the end of my formal comments. Um, thank you very much. I really appreciate being here. Fantastic. Thanks. Thank you, Gina, so much for all that information. And as you mentioned, uh, we will definitely make sure to include the links uh, on the event page on my website, um, along with the other material from the presenters. So we've got 11 minutes for some Q&A. Uh, so we're going to do a kind of lightning round to the extent that we can. Let me just take a look at some of the questions that have come in. Um, so one, one question was, what can be done to support aging in my own home, including end of life? And I think somebody touched upon this a little bit earlier, um, but, but any suggestions for aging, aging at home? There are a lot of things. Um, I'll jump in and, and I'm sure that everyone here has some recommendations, but um, assess your home for, if, is everything on one level? Are you able to get around um, in doorways easily? If there were a walker or other equipment that you needed to stay at home, um, there are organizations um, in each county, I think, that can refer people um, and also that you can get some additional support um, if you needed handrails. Um, a lot of things with uh, aging at home, I'd say it's both um, logistically, uh, practically, and then your support circles. Um, in order to be able to age at home, you also need to make sure that you're going to be able to um, uh, see what your, as Patricia said, keep your network close to you um, and get to know your neighbors and, and um, have the support services and, and circles learn about what's available in advance. So practically um, making sure that you can um, have access to everything that you need in your own home and you would be safe. Um, and uh, logistically and socially supporting the, the care and delivery of things that you might need. Um, and you can also check in with senior service agencies 
in the county, um, as well as you can interview hospices, you can interview organizations <laughs> before you need them and find out what's available. Well, a lot of it has to do with how much money you have and how, what are your assets. I mean, if you want to be able to stay at home, you know, if you're rich, you're always going to be able to stay at home because you can pay for uh, care, home care. Home care is extraordinarily expensive. In the Bay Area in San Francisco, it's about $40 an hour, and they require at least two or three days a week, and, and it's very expensive. Um, if you are poor and low income, $1,400 a month or less, you will be eligible for Medi-Cal home and community-based services and you can get in-home supportive services in thousands or the PACE program or the assisted living waiver program. There's all kinds of home and community-based services as well. Per services that you can get at home, in including the PACE program in San Francisco. So, uh, you know, it, depending on what, where you are, yeah, um, yeah I, I would add one more thing that if you can afford, then buying long term care insurance is another way to ensure that you could afford some care at home, because I do see a lot of patients who don't have family members who can support even if they want to, because right. people have life on their side. Usually it's there. It's it's too late. I mean, if you're I, I got my mother a home care policy when she was 79 years old, thank God. But I'll tell you what, it helped pay for almost two hundred thousand dollars worth of home care over the years. Mm. If you're young enough, you can still buy a policy. And, yeah. But I would not do a, a, a nursing home policy. I would get a home care policy. That's what you need. Great advice. Thank you very much. Can someone with breast cancer who is not near end of life yet qualify for palliative care under most insurance, uh, under most insurances? Yes, by, by all means, if you have any symptoms, if there's any psychosocial issues, any spiritual distress, you definitely can qualify for palliative care. You just have to ask. Perfect. Thank you very much, doctor. So someone wrote in with, with a story that, that their father had gone through um, that had to do with advanced care directives from one state not being recognized in another state. And so the question that they have is, will other states honor my California advanced care directive and are there any steps I can take to increase the likelihood that they will? So uh, all these forms, each state has the same form named differently and the best. And now they're coming up with national policies that each state has to honor cross state paperwork. So the key is to have that paperwork with you. And some people actually take a screenshot on their phones and have it available and or they carry a photocopy with you, as long as there is something, or just say, contact this person X if you wanted to know my wishes. So all of those things people do in different ways to make sure that the wishes are honored. But yes, yeah. your, your forms are honored. There's no more reciprocity now. Years ago, it, they did not recognize it, but now there's reciprocity among the states, which is great. And, and just to add to that, I mean, it was a very sad uh, tale and, and really challenging to, uh, situation for that family. If you know that you have a family member out of state, ask them to ask their doctors or their health system there or contact them yourselves and say, I have a family member. Will this be honored or what else do I need to do to make sure it is? Find out in advance. Thanks. Thank and there much. are also apps now that you can have your paperwork uploaded and that can go on your phone. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff going on in the tech world too regarding that. There always is. There always is. Uh, if you live alone and don't own your home or have nearby family, does hospice have an affordable care center? What is the length of time one can stay at such a center? So this is, um, this is tricky. Um, in some areas where it is much less expensive property wise, um, there are uh, significant residential hospices. In California, there are very few. I mentioned we have one in Redwood City, um, which is a beautiful place. You're welcome to visit, um, but it's, a, it's six beds. So we can only take patients who are really in the last week or two, um, last month for sure of their life. And home uh, room and board is not paid for there. All the medical care, like in hospice, is covered, but the room and board is not as it would be anywhere else. Um, so you can look, um, although it's lower cost than most room and boards, um, there are, um, for someone that can't live at home, if there is an assisted living facility, a nursing home, 
a friend or family member you can live with, hospice can come to you there. Great. And then if you're a veteran, there's a VA inpatient hospice too that you can access. Yes. Um, and there is a place called Gift of Love. If you were lower income and were a male, then they also take you in. It's run by nuns. So those are other options in the locally in the area. Gotcha. Actually, I, I didn't add, um, we don't turn people away for the inability to pay at the hospice house. We do have community donations that support people as well. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. For those who don't have a directive, what age should one start discussing it with their family and or planning? At age 18, as soon as you turn an adult, you should have an advanced directive. No okay. excuses. Today. Yeah. Today. yeah. That's the first question. I, I teach at San Francisco State in a, in a graduate program in gerontology. First question I ask them, how many of you have an advanced health care directive? Mm. Oh, I, you know, I'm only I'm in my 20s. I don't need it. But if you look at the case law on, you know, right to die, almost all of the cases involve young people yeah. um, mm. in motorcycle mm. accidents or this or that. So I mean, we, it, I agree. 18. 18. Perfect. Mm -hmm. There's unanimity. Uh, <laughs> uh, somebody asked, well, what about donating your body instead of other dispositions? I, yes, that is a, that is a great option. Um, we actually had an advisory committee men member from the Sierra Donor Services uh, that was on my committee for a few years. Um, we've gone and seen their, their setup. And that is a, that is a great way. You most likely won't even need a funeral home in that case. They kind of come and take the body um, from the home or from the, the hospital, um, depending on timing and what they need exactly. I'm not sure if there's time for a service. Those are the kind of things that you need to take into consideration. But celebrations of life, they're, they're, the, new, they're the new way to celebrate the mm -hmm. life of your loved ones. So that might be a good option for that. Perfect. And, and just quick clarification, I completely agree, Gina. And it is something that you have to plan in advance. UCSF and um, Stanford, you have to complete yes. the paperwork and the whole process in advance. It can't be done by your family members after the fact. Very right. helpful. Good, great point. Um, is there the last question? And then again, either, either, if we weren't able to get to your question, we'll do our best to get you an answer as soon as possible, uh, you know, in the coming days or week. Um, but, uh, and where did my question go? Is there a to-do list somewhere that tells what things one must deal with, uh, if, and when, excuse me, let me try that again. Is there a to-do list somewhere that tells what things one must deal with in the time frame when a spouse dies? So is there kind of a, a, a you know, go-to resource yeah, um, someone mentioned the ARP list. They do have a very good list. What to do when someone dies. Great. Great. Yes, I have that link. I'll give that to Isabel to that um, article. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Perfect. Um, I think, oh, and it's 530. There it is. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, uh, so much again. Gina, Pat, Dr. Mara, Mary, really appreciate y'all uh, participating in, in tonight's uh, kind of very educational and informa informational Zoom. Uh, you know, we had over 100 constituents uh, who participated through pretty much the whole thing. I also want to really thank Isabella Sal on my on my team uh, for all the work she put in into making tonight's event uh, such a big success. Uh, and don't hesitate, again, to call our office if you have any questions, if there's anything we can do. And we'll put all the information and links up, links up on our website as well. Um, so thank you again, everybody. Really appreciate the presenters and, and really appreciate so many constituents uh, joining us for tonight's conversation. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the... Have a nice public. evening, thank everyone. You. Celebrate life. That's yes. amen. Amen. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you all.